In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report is going to come from the Book of Psalms. And the Psalms are really interesting because since they are so short and because they are very pointed, what typically happens with the Psalms is each Psalm will follow a consistent theme. That's something that's very, very common. And this theme is no different. This is a psalm of praise. And so all you're going to see in this psalm is offering praises to God for things that he has done for the psalm's author here, the psalmist. So let's go ahead and with that in mind, look at Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, How awesome are your works! Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Selah. Now, in this particular psalm, I think that it offers praise, but it also gives the reason behind the praise. And that's one thing that is important because some Christians, like myself, actually struggle with the calls in the Bible to offer praise. It was something that seemed very odd to me because one of the virtues in the Bible is humility and that God has no need of anything. He's all-powerful. So why would a God that is all-powerful that doesn't need praise and also one that when he came here in human form exercised extreme humility, it seems almost out of character that God would give his people actual commands to praise. That seems odd. But then when you think about it, isn't that a natural outgrowth of anything that we are glad that we have or have found in our lives? For example, if you find a wonder product that just makes kitchen work so much easier or housework or yard work so much easier, you typically tell people about it. You're excited to be able to share that with them so they can have that in their life too. And isn't that really all praise to God is? It's telling other people, man, look at the great things that God has been doing in my life. Look at all these things that, that God has done for me. And the reason that you're telling them that, or at least if you're doing it out of the correct motivation, is I want you to have the same thing. I want you to see God working in your life. And that is a great blessing that we can share with other people. And ultimately, that's what this psalm kind of sets out to do. It asks the question and then answers the question, why do we praise God? And then it answers in these verses, well, because he deserves it. If you're looking at this passage, it talks about praising God and all the earth, and then it says, why do we praise him? Well, how awesome are your works? The greatness of your power, the enemies even feign obedience to you. Now think about that line, that God's power is so overwhelming, that it is so obvious, that even the enemies, that they don't believe that God really is worthy of praise, are going to pretend to praise him, pretend to be obedient, pretend to bend to his will, just because they're afraid of, oh, I don't know, getting destroyed. And this was at a time in the scripture where God did that in a very obvious and literal way. He doesn't really do that anymore even though I think that there are still probably people that feign obedience because of that, the, the fire insurance Christians is what you would call them, the ones that uh, pretend to be obedient, pretend to be Christians, that show up to church uh, every Sunday and every Wednesday night like clockwork because they're just checking that off the spiritual checklist so that they can avoid being sent into tor uh, torment. That's a shallow faith, though. And that's one of the things that the psalmist here is pointing out. That's not a deep faith, and it's not a faith done for the right reason. But God's power and presence is so awesome and overwhelming and obvious to any that are willing to look at it that it even draws people that are afraid of God's wrath. That it's so obvious to them and those around them, they say, 
yeah, we're going to at least, if nothing else, put up the appearance of obedience just in case. And sure, it's shallow, but isn't that a testament to how great God is? That there are even people that want to pretend to be followers even if they're not willing to put the work in. I think that that does speak a lot to the motivation, and ultimately it's a bad motivation. It's not the motivation that God wants. But isn't motivating people to where they do some right things, isn't that better than just flat-out disobedience? I mean, even somebody that sort of pretends to be obedient for a time may learn something and pick it up and then learn to mature in their faith and be actually obedient. In the same way, originally, when you teach your kids to eat their vegetables or brush their teeth, are they doing it because they know that it's good for them and they want to do it because they want to take care of themselves? No, they're not doing that. They're children. They're doing it because they're afraid they're going to get whooped or they're going to be punished in some other way. And so, yeah, it's a shallow place to start out. It's not a mature place to start out. But it's a better starting place than just being disobedient. And over time, they learn, hey, this actually does work. This is a good idea. This is something that I should be doing. And that really leads us to the second half of this psalm. We'll read the next few verses in Psalm 66, verses 5 through 7. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. Let us rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. So, in this verse, which is, of course, following the, the verses that we just read, this is the inverse. You see, this is the mature kind of faith. The kind of faith that looks at the deeds of God, looks at the wonders that have been wrought, in that person's life, or in the lives of others. It doesn't even necessarily have to be wonderful things that happen in your life. It can be things that you see God doing in other people's life and go, man, God is truly a God worthy of praise. That's the kind of mature faith that God is actually looking for. That's the inverse with the right motivation that God wants us all to have. And then it makes an observation that is made multiple times in the Psalms you know, worded different ways, but it's ultimately the same. How incredible is it that God looks after the sons of men? I mean, think about this. Sit down and really think about it for a second. You have here an all-powerful creator of the universe who can do literally anything he wants, and anything he wants to make, all he has to do is think it, and it will be. It will be. That's the kind of power that God has, and yet, what does he spend? Well, spending time is a little bit of a non-starter with God, since he doesn't really spend time the way that we do. He doesn't exist inside time. But isn't it amazing that a God like that, an all-powerful creator, that has literally limitless power and, and limitless possibilities, decides that he thinks we're important enough to talk to, to check on, to make sure we're doing okay. And not only that he was willing to just kind of do that sort of from afar like a distant parent, that's not all God did. He got directly involved in our lives. He does wonderful works in our lives, which is one of the things that is alluded to in this psalm. When the Israelites were in trouble, an all-powerful God, who by our human understanding shouldn't really concern himself with the affairs of insignificant men that are mortal and can maybe live, what, a hundred years at the most? And yet, our God decided that he was going to intervene. He was going to take care of us. He was going to directly affect our lives because he wants to have that kind of relationship with us. That's the kind of God that we serve, and that's the reason that our God is absolutely, without question, worthy of praise. We serve a God that loves us enough to give his only son as an atonement for our sin, a sacrifice. So it's not just that God, ah, in his spare time, he doesn't have anything better to do, so he'll look after us. No, God loved us enough to make a very serious conscious choice to sacrifice his only son for us. Despite the fact that, let's be honest, we weren't really worth saving in the first place. 
Despite the fact that we made the decision to leave God, to abandon him and rebel against him through sin. And yet God looks at that and says, I want you back enough that I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I want a relationship with you bad enough that any price that can be named of me is not too high. That is the kind of God that we serve. And that is why the psalmist and millions of people, both Jew and Christian, over the eons, have looked at God and said, yeah, that's a God that is absolutely worthy of our praise, and so much more. Stay the course, friends. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic-looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.